Yeah. Andrea, could, could you also forward me the uh, the legislative agenda? I've, I know you missed resent it this morning, but I've misfiled it. Yes, and we are live, Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you very much. And uh, welcome to our special meeting. Uh, we are um, in a conversation with uh, State Senator Lisa Wellman, who represents uh, Mercer Island uh, down in Olympia. So first of all, happy holidays to you, Senator. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I'm delighted to have this meeting. Um, I, I would love to do it every year. Let's make sure that we do, because I think it's invaluable to, to stay connected. Great. Thank you. I, th I think we're going to try for sure. And in the, <laughs> on the council, I know that uh, it's something that Jesse has on her uh, schedule to do uh, going forward. And, um, you know, I think I think uh, Senator uh, Craig Reynolds is another council person uh, on this meeting right now. We have a lot of scheduling, just it's a very busy time during the year. Uh, we have Police Chief uh, Ed Holmes and we have uh, Chief of Operations uh, Jason Kittner. Uh, unfortunately, uh, City Manager Jesse Bond is not able to join us, uh, but I suspect she will be in contact with you uh, when necessary. So um, I guess. First things, I know that the session is going to be short. Uh, so before we talk about our specific legislative uh, agenda priorities, I just would welcome, um, ask you to provide us kind of an overview of what you see is coming down, uh, what's the focus. Uh, obviously, last session, there's a lot of attention on uh, climate change and, and legislation in that area. Um, what do you see this coming sh short session, I guess? Well, I think everybody is waiting for a transportation package and, and that's high on the list uh, to give us direction about what is happening. And so I do expect to see that. Um, I've been attending, I just back from uh, two weeks of conferences. Uh, there, were, there were about five conferences smushed together. So between the two weeks, I, I, I think I touched a, a little on all of them. Um, a lot of discussion at these conferences, which I don't think that we've really discussed yet as far as the session is concerned, on the, the nature of the workforce and where we are financially. Um, you know, we had 4.3 million people drop out of the workforce, uh, which we've already, you know, started to see the issues about. We certainly see it in education, where we are down over 20% of our superintendents are, are, have retired, teachers have retired. Uh, bus drivers are not to be found. Um, so I think that there's going to be a lot of shakeup that we're all experiencing, which I think it uh, will will try to respond to in, in ways uh, in general. But I, you know, I think that those issues are out there. There's a lot of reskilling of the of the workforce as well, which I think um, is important to note. So that will be impacting our um, technical and community colleges, and we'll see. You know, we'll see those changes. Um, I'm trying not to make any massive changes, just to continue on what we're doing in education, and not to make any massive changes. We do have a significant amount of funding that will impact our childcare system. And so trying to make sure that we have um, childcare in place, more seats, but of course, we lost almost half of, of the childcare centers and a lot of people dropped out. So there's gonna be a, a tumult happening there. And of course, we know that um, people can't return to work uh, if there isn't childcare available. So there's, there's a lot of continuing disruption um, going on. And I think that that will impact our citizenry, what it will mean to you, I don't know. I know that there has been talk about the 1% cap on, um, on uh, local government um, uh, funding. And um, I and others would like to see that raised. Um, I, will, I don't know if there's a bill. It's not a bill coming through my committees, but it would come through local government probably, um, and, or, and or just come through the appropriations committees. Um, we certainly, if that's possible, would like to see something happening. I mean, I, I think we're very much aware that the one cap doesn't, one percent cap does doesn't work. Um, well, can I ask a question as a follow up? And, and uh, Councilmember Reynolds, you should and others on the phone. I mean, it's a small enough group. We can just have a nice conversation. Sure, please. As a follow up on that one percent, are you seeing a trend? I mean, are more and more legislators leaning towards? 
increasing that 1% because uh, SCA and other uh, organizations, uh, AWC, you know, and Mercer Island, for instance, we've been advocating for that 1% increase for years. And so it just seems to go nowhere. I'm just kind of curious if, you, if you're seeing. Well, I think that there's more appetite for even looking at it now because of the amount of money that's coming through the federal government to the states. So, you know, and we have, because of the sales taxes right now, um, we have been, you know, seen a rise in, in the amount of money coming into the state um, because of the way we raise money. Uh, so I think that it's possible that there's more appetite for it right now. I'm not promising it, but I, I certainly think the conversation is going to take place this term. Um, I think that uh, for um, Chief Barnes, we're, we're going to be looking at a lot of the, the, the general stuff that was done, you know, that was in law and gov government in, in the um, Law and Justice Committee. And I think that that we see some needs for adjustment. Um, and um, I know that I just spoke to Renton and, and Renton as always pushes for more seats at the academy, more training uh, you know, available. That's, that, I think that that's critical. And then um, uh, also <laughs> I know that May, Mayor Pavone was, is, is very much talking about um, reasonable suspicion, probable cause issues and so uh, it sounds reasonable to me. I'd love to have your input there, but um, it sounds as though what we change to probable cause needs some things need to be put back for reasonable suspicion because we're we're stepping in our own way and, and you know not achieving what we want. That was one thing that just came up, which I thought was um, um, I'm very conscious of our transportation you know needs in terms of we're part of the east side. That whole a 405, you know, uh, uh, issue, and and so um, anything that makes that flow better, you know, is a good thing, and and we'll be looking at that. I'm trying to think if there's anything. Um, so that is, keep jumping in and, and pushing me to. I've got yeah. so many things floating around. I, I, I appreciate it. I know that there's a lot going on, and uh, you're going to be incredibly. Bu you're busy now, and you'll be even more busy. Yeah. Next month, and so uh, Chief Holmes, I don't know if. There's anything you want to um, ask or comment upon? Um, so, sure. Uh, good morning or afternoon, I guess, by now, Senator. So it's really nice to see you. So you mentioned a minute ago. I, I don't want to go into all the police reform issues here. It's probably not the right uh, time for that. Uh, we could certainly have a one-on-one. -on -one. I can go into a lot more detail as I did with Representative Ty and Sen, but. Um, you mentioned the reasonable suspicion of probable cause. So I think in the simplest way to describe that, uh, under a, a reasonable suspicion, we are able to use a, a reasonable amount of force to stop someone or detain someone long enough to figure out if they're the perpetrator of the crime. Right. So if, if someone was, it was uh, suffered a violent assault, and they described a suspect, and the officer pulls up and sees that described suspect running from the scene, uh, prior to this new law, the officer could order that person to stop. If the person did not stop, the officer could use reasonable force to detain that person long enough for the victim to come out and say, yes, that's the person who did it, or no, you right. don't. Under the new law, we cannot use any force unless we first establish probable cause, which is the bar we use to arrest that person, which we usually don't have as we're approaching or coming into the scene. That, that right. is develop a little later so if there was some consideration and i know there's there's you know they call them fixes i don't know if i like that word but adjustments or clarification yeah um, to allow for at a minimum to allow for police to use some degree of force if it's a violent crime if if the legislature doesn't want us using any force on shoplifters or property crime okay uh, i don't like that but uh, the violent crime th those are the ones i worry most about um I'll do two more two more quick things I'll highlight. Um, we, we deal with people who are in mental crisis sometimes, uh, suicidal subjects that we can use, again, some reasonable amount of force to get them to the hospital. Uh, that's how we used to do it. Under the new law, it says, you know, to use force, you must first de-escalate um, to include walking away. And so when officers are ordered to exhaust all 
de-escalation techniques to include walking away when no crime has been committed, we have to do that. Well, suicide's not a crime. It, it's a tragedy, you know, in, in, in families, I, I, I've seen that. Um, so some thought to clarifying what it is the legislature means. Are officers covered, you know, liability wise, if they apply some force to get someone who's in mental crisis to the hospital, but it took some force to get them there. So yeah. that, you know, think about that. And the last one, again, there's more, but the last one would just be, um, there's a prohibition on what's called military equipment. And so we have, for example, um, it, 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 it meets the definition of a rifle, but it shoots a foam baton. So in other words, it's, a, it's an alternative to deadly force. We can use a foam baton. It's like a launcher, it launches a foam baton but it's greater than 50 caliber. So technically we would be in violation if we deploy such a thing. So I've had to put them on the shelf and we've lost an option to exercise uh, an alternative to deadly force. So there's more, more Senator, but just some of those, and I'm sure you've heard some of the discussion around that, but one of the, you know, the bigger ones would be that reasonable suspicion, just being able to use some degree of reasonable force. It has yeah. to reasonable to stop somebody long enough to say, hey, is this the person that just assaulted you? Um, it just, it's really hard when we can't, or they say, you know, forget it, I'm leaving. Um, and we really can't touch them. Yeah. So, so thank ahead. you. And if you do want a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, if you think that that would be useful, it's not my committee. I, I rely on people who have studied the law and what have you. Um, but I do know that there's acknowledgement that there are certain things that need to be reviewed. Um, no law is perfect going in, but we certainly don't want to go in the wrong direction. Um, and and it's, it's threading a needle. It's, it, it is challenging, uh, but we're, we're, we don't want to make it more challenging for you to do the job either. Um, it, it's not lost on me, you know, the origin of the need to have some reforms. So I, I'm not suggesting... Right, that, yeah do away with everything. The, our, our state chiefs association, WASPIC, sheriffs and chiefs association supported reforms. I, I in, as an individual chief, I support reforms that make sense. So um, it's, it seems like some of these uh, are not good for public safety. So those are the ones I really want to spend some time looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor, are there any specific um, capital budget requests that you, you're going to be making? Um, good question. I think uh, our chief of operations, Jason Kittner, might be in a better position to, to answer that. I know that obviously we're <laughs> like every city, we're looking forward to getting, um, you know, the ARPA funds and, and whatever. And, you know, we did pass, uh, you know, our budget and our capital improvement program and, and what have you. So there's a number of capital improvement projects uh, lined up. Um, infrastructure remains a huge issue in terms of uh, you know, water and sewer and, and whatever. But uh, uh, Jason, do you want to provide a little bit more uh, detail? And I don't know in terms of specific um, asks that we may have reached out and what opportunities there may be for additional grants. But well, uh, let me let me just say that um, I, I have I, I find that I I have uh, yearly meetings, of course, with both Issaquah and Renton, um, they're very much on top and usually Bellevue just gives me their list without a meeting. But um, there is, for instance, when, when a park, uh, you know, a park pathway just is crumbling and falling apart and, and there's money needed for that, that can be part of a capital budget ask. Um, there has been asks for um, the capital budget, I, with their money went to the Bellevue Art Museum. Bellevue, uh, Bellevue asked for funding for their, their major park that you've seen downtown for the entrance way. That was a big ask. I think that was an almost a million dollars that they needed for how to, how to finish the park off with the new entrance way right onto Bellevue way. So uh, there, there are things that you know we can put together if you're interested and there are specific things that you need, um, whether, I don't, whether it's infrastructure and infrastructure, if it is, you know, as you know, low cost loans certainly is something that the public works board that I sat on for so long um, is, is able to do, but there may be something in infrastructure that we, we can help with. So just be thinking about that. If you don't have anything now, it still may be something that um, we're not in session yet 
And it, it will be, uh, you know, at least a month and a half before we start going through the capital budget asks. Can I, uh, can I just, before maybe Jason weighs in, so is there a time frame or a deadline to get that list? We're not as aggressive, obviously, as this will call Bellevue and uh, Renton. I mean, maybe we're, you know. No, you're not. No, you're not. I, 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 you know, it's, it's kind of like, hey, guys, money's sitting here and you're, you're my people. Okay. And this is uh, my right. community. Um, yeah. So, so, so is there a deadline for getting something to you, uh, Senator? There will, there will be. As I say, it, will, it doesn't happen until the last. So we're going to be in for two months. Probably the last, the first three weeks, we won't even be touching capital budget. And, and then they come around and they say, are, what are your capital budget asks? And um, I, I, there's a form that is filled out. We can send the form to you to, so that you can we can work with you. That's what Noah Berger, who is my legislative assistant, that's what he will do. Um, and then we'll put it in and see if we get, you know, the money. And, and it can be something that I share with my seatmates, Tana and me, Lynn. Um, yeah. And so we all put in for 25000 of a $75,000 ask, something like that, um, to, to assure that, we, you know, we get the money or it can be, you know, some, some whatever the amount of money might be. Um, I, know, I don't know I whether the whether the lid, the parks on the lid, are they in condition? Do they need additional something or other? That's the kind of thing that that could it, it could be used for. That's, that's, Senator, I, if I can chime in on that, that's very helpful. Make sure you keep us informed on process, and I'd love to see that form. Um, as we look ahead in the city, we're going to be facing renewal of, of a parks levy coming up soon, and the city's going to have a, a the new council will have some tough decisions on how ambitious that ask is, because certainly there are some minimum operational levy that could be passed, or conceivably we could opt for something bigger to, for example, uh, compl uh, complete with the, uh, the Aubrey Davis Park master plan, the Lid Park, or we're facing a, a major dark dock upgrade park uh, project in Luther Burbank. That might That's something that benefits not just the city, but everybody around, and, and, and I think, uh, we as a council need to decide what our priorities are and, and maybe come up with a, a top three items we'd love to see to feed to you perhaps. Now, this is, a, this is the second half of the budget year. So there's already one capital budget. So there's a supplemental, which is much less money. Therefore, 23 will be the first year of that. And so that's, if you can, you could think of something that is something small now that, that you're thinking of, but then a, a larger ask in 23, in the session 23, which, which, which is the first year, the big, the big year. That, that, that's good because it'll probably take us some time to figure out what we want. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to. I know our city clerk is, uh, and also the assistant to our city manager is also uh, uh, listening in. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, Andrea, maybe somebody will contact Noah in the senator's office just to make sure that the city gets the form and so we are... i made it i made a note uh, oh, you know, okay. to make sure that okay. noah um, is aware that you're interested and um the form to you to well to angela or to jason or to andrea andrea yeah, yeah andrea yeah. okay all right that'd be great senator thank you so much uh you know obviously <laughs> wherever we can get additional monies that that's great absolutely absolutely uh, yeah, you know, you know, one thing that we did have a meeting so far with uh, state representative Milan Tai, and she, I, I don't, it, well, it's not. She also said it's not her committee, so I get, I get it. But she thought that perhaps mental health uh, issues, uh, counseling issues, would also be a rather dominant uh, as as far as down the session. I don't know if you have that same sense and. Yes, I, you know, we know that um, one of the things that we've heard and seen actually in real numbers has been the stress and strain on families and as well as children in our school system. It's been hard for them. Um, we, are, uh, we are asking for additional funding. As you may know, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but I think this is, would be somewhat correct. Um, in the ESSER funds that came out for education, there were three ESSER funds. The, generally speaking, schools received, in, in terms of the majority of schools, they probably received between five and, and $10,000 or $12,000 per pupil for the school. 
and and Mercer Island received three hundred and fifty dollars. And so what we did was to um, we came out of session with a floor of five hundred. So Mercer Island got the difference between three hundred and fifty and five hundred. So an additional one hundred and fifty for each student. Uh, what we're pushing for, and I've been talking with uh, Lisa Callen, who is also on education uh, in the house side, and we're pushing for a floor of 1500 because um, I don't think we'll, we'll necessarily get that. I would be happy if I can get it to even 1000, 1200 or 1000 so that we would then be sending Mercer Island the difference and, and would hope that that would help in addressing some of the, the mental health needs, um, which I think are, are, you know, really obvious. Now, one of the challenges for any state, and, and certainly for Washington State, is there just aren't that many people available. You know, it's not like you can put three psychologists in every school or, or whatever, you can't. But so people are coming up with all kinds of ways of creating that environment, in many cases using our um, community-based organizations like the Boys and Girls Club or, or the Scouts or, or even uh, the Recreation Department. There are a lot of different ways that people are thinking of helping to address some of the stress that kids, are, you know, that kids have been facing and will continue to face. I mean, so far I'm feeling pretty good about the, the numbers that we've had we're, we've been pretty good about vaccinations. And we certainly, I have not heard here about attacks during the school board meetings, which we have seen and heard across the state. Um, the the um, uh, weaponizing, you know, kind of words and, and, and all kinds of issues. Um, I think it is somewhat relaxed here, although I was very much um, offended by uh, and concerned about the neighborhood um, uh, uh, on online, you know, online communities that were going on to next door and stuff and stuff. And if you went on there just to watch about the conversation, uh, I think we would be horrified to hear about people, uh, how people talked about each other. It was just not something I'm used to. And so that even, even in a community like, Mercer Island, and I'm prejudiced, you know, I just don't think that those, but they do happen, and they yeah. are going on, and I think that we have to be very vigilant in, um, you know, both with adults, you know, as well as for children. I know that one of, one of my good friends who is, has been the superintendent of, of schools out in uh, Kitsap, um, says, you know, kind of, if you've got some problems in the school at nine o'clock, take these things away from the kids or eight o'clock, don't let them continue using their cell phones in the evening because we, we watch it and it just exacerbates the situation uh, enormously. Uh, so um, hopefully if there's more money coming in, there will be more ability to look for social workers and, and psychologists and counselors. Uh, <laughs> And how can, I mean, I think that'd be fantastic. And obviously we have a very uh, uh, active uh, YFS and, and school-based counselors. And um, I, I'm just curious, how can we help uh, push that along, you know, be advocates? Uh, is that a matter of tracking? Well, I, I, I'm hoping to have a conversation with the head of uh, Ways and Means today to tell her, you know, just to give her the numbers. I, I don't wait until we're in session to drop bombs on, on, on uh, you know, kind of whatever. It's like, here's the plan, here's what we're looking for, here's what we have. So advocates have already um, consolidated around the ask. Now it's just a question of how much we were going in. Very frankly, the way this works, we started off last session with a floor of 1,500. Um, then the next thing I heard, well, we were thinking of 1,000, it went to 500, 500 additional dollars. And then it went, when it got to the house, they, they slammed it down to a floor of 500. So Mercer Island, instead of getting an additional 500 per student, got 150 per student. Um, so it was so negligible, it really was negligible because I think people just are not aware. Number one, uh, the, the kinds of things that, that the schools have been responding to way outside of their normal you know, it's it's just been 24 seven, seven days a week in issues and, and, and what have you um, with, with staffing. 
just doing contact tracing has taken people, you know, somebody reports that they've been near somebody and then the school has to do all the calling. Uh, teachers have to be quarantined. Um, they have to use the funds that they hadn't intended to use for substitute teachers to come in when actually after all of this, there's no COVID being passed around. And so it's, it's just been a huge stress. Is there a, uh, a Senate bill number or is there any house, is there a bill number that we can sort of track or? Not yet, no. And it may not be a bill, it may be a proviso. We, we're oh. working on which way is the best way forward to do it as a bill or to do it as a proviso. And bills are dropping this week. There is no bill for that. Um, we're not, there's no bill yet. And we're only, I guess with everybody, everybody's gotten one or two bills already posted the numbers of, you know, so there's a lot of bills out there, but um, certainly we're far from getting all the bills pre-filed, which would be before session even starts. We're, um, we're trying to get many pre-filed. I, I, I can't speak on behalf of the entire council, but I suspect that, um, the council, the new council will certainly be supportive of the proviso or any kind of bill that does, you know, I guess, you know, maybe if, if <laughs> sorry to ask Noah to, <laughs> to keep it, to keep us apprised, but if there's something that comes out that we're, the Mercer Island City Council might be able to weigh in and also our YFS department, you know, uh, I think folks might be inclined to see what we can do to help out as, as additional advocates, I'm glad that this is something that's going on. But um, the, you know, the more, the louder sometimes the voices, uh, perhaps the better. So, but one of the things that we can do, we will continue to have remote um, uh, committee meetings. And um, I have to say that of all the things, one of the things that came out positively out of COVID has been the fact that we went remote. It gave people all over the state an opportunity to weigh in, even if it's just to sign up pro or con on some issue, which you can do from your own computer in your home now, you know, without having to come and register in Olympia. Um, it just made, I think, a very much more de democratic process um, of people expressing their opinions. And so um, I certainly can, can share, uh, I don't know whether it's with um, Council Member Reynolds or you or whomever, um, the idea that there are bills, this is what's, what's coming up in education, um, and also I do sit on energy, environment, and technology. You know, I think that we're pretty good as far as our, um, our broadband here has been pretty good. Of course, we're looking to push it, to, you know, much higher eventually uh, to one gig symmetrical. Um, I don't know of any other bills in, in the environment area. You were already done in your GMA, um, your 10-year GMA response. I think that Mercer Island has already included climate in that. I think that that's one of the things that I am hearing they're going to add as a requirement, but I believe you've already done it. I, I think we could always do more, but yes, there are large components of that in, 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 our, uh, in our plan. I'd love to see a state requirement for all communities to do that though. It's very important, I believe. I think that there is there will be a bill that does address that this year. I mean, it just makes sense. The other thing, just to tell you that I, I coming back from these committees, I don't know if you've got have you got the time for me to talk a little bit? Absolutely, more? absolutely. Uh, the thing the thing that I I thought was very interesting was the focus um, on autonomous vehicles and the electrification of our transportation. So uh, TAAS Transportation as a Service. Um, I think people are talking about, we're seeing car manufacturers looking to shift their, um, their, their projections of what they will be making much more towards autonomous electrified vehicles. And, uh, and you know, there's, there is an issue as far as the state is concerned to have no um, uh, gasoline engine cars after 1930, after 2035, you know, there's that kind of focus. So I think the electrification of, of um, whether it's housing and or city services, I know you've already got you know, some going on, but um, that might be something that you wanna bring up as a, as a council uh, or even ask for help with in terms of a capital budget. Senator, if, if I may, uh, one of our topics on here was transportation and, and that leads very nicely into that. 
um, you know, the light rail coming to Mercer Island, while it will have its challenges, will certainly have huge benefits as well. But we've lost quite a lot of intra-island bus service in the last couple of years. So in any sort of funding for options that will, in, will assist with that last mile, be it autonomous vehicles, be it more community bus service, whatever it is, we'd love to see some progress made. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, and I think that um, perhaps if if you and Bellevue were to do a joint session, even if you're doing remote sessions or whatever for your city council meetings, doing a remote, I know that um, that has been probably one of the lead things that Bellevue constantly talks about, and and there is a it, they have their own contingent there doubling up uh, and doubling down on uh, autonomous vehicles electrification. So they've been very much invested in, in that um, area. And um, I don't, if you guys get together, I don't know what you do, uh, whether you know you work together on that, but that might be something that might be worthwhile getting together and, and looking at an east side an, an east side plan, a strategic plan. I'm big on strategic plans. I really like them. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. You know, you mentioned something, Senator, um, regarding the electrification of housing. I know that uh, this has come up in some other uh, forums where people are, are hoping that perhaps down in Olympia that there would be a less, well, a change in the building codes because right now, um, you know, if the focus is trying to uh, discourage the use of fossil fuels in the construction of and remodeling of residential, single family residences. Yeah. Everything is governed by the state building code. And so I think some cities would love the, you know, love the opportunity to have some flexibility to perhaps, you know, adopt a, a, a building code for their own city that is a little bit more restrictive and hopefully moves people towards electrification. And so yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think in terms of building that that capability of, of charging it within the home, you know, yeah. in new home construction is something that people are going to be looking at um, for sure. And again, it's really, a, again, looking to give the cities that flexibility to adopt something different from the state mandated building code. So anyway, um, right. I know I know your time is precious. I, I just have one other thing. And yeah. For me, I know uh, maybe Councilmember Reynolds has others, but um, you know, having having been mayor for the past two years, you know, obviously this pandemic has dominated everything. And of course, with the Open uh, Public Meetings Act, and so I'm hopeful. I think everybody's hopeful that maybe we can get back to you know in-person meetings at some point. But you know, right now with Omicron and whatever else, it's just unclear. And so. You know, again, SCA and others have been advocating a change in the uh, Open Public Meetings Act uh, to allow, you know, basically, you know, right now, obviously, the governor, rightfully so, has been just extending and, and declaring, you know, whatever. Um, but we, we need more flexibility uh, to hold virtual meetings without uh, requiring a physical uh, meeting location for the public necessarily. So, yeah, you can just... That's the reality of, what the, of the world that we are now living in. And so um, that act probably needs to be updated. I'll, I'll take a look at that. Obviously, you know, we have worked around it to enable us to have a legislature that keeps going. Um, right. And we will be on the floor in person. We will not be uh, in committee in person. We're gonna do the committees still remotely. And um, when it comes to floor action, um, it's the, the chambers have been rearranged so that the, the Senate can meet, the House can't meet because there isn't enough room in that area for them to come back. So they're still, as far as I can tell, they may have half of their people in and half of their people remotely, which is, it is challenging. We've done it. We, we did it. We had people on the floor before and some pe most people at, at home. Uh, so our, we're, we're and, and actually, you know, I think that there were some real positives because of it. As I said, there were some challenges. You know, you just didn't get to work a bill by running over to the other house and talking to somebody and having that ease of. So we we did much many fewer bill, bills. We didn't have um, companion bills where both the house and the senate, and then one of them goes. Um, but it, it so fewer bills. 
a lot more focus on the bills, which I think produced better bills in general. Um, but I, I, I'll look at the Public Meetings Act and see if we can get, if, if that requires us to make a, a, a legislative change to enable you to have more flexibility, is what you're asking. That, that'd be great, I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Reynolds, yeah. Yeah, just probably one last thing, because I, I have to run to a, to a meeting here in a few moments, but uh, if I could channel for City Manager Bond, who was not able to make it today, she would have asked if she had been here, I think, in any bill that the legislature passes that imposes a burden on cities, if you can be mindful of allowing us appropriate transition time to implement the new procedures and go through the appropriate uh, pub uh, public meeting, hearing process, et cetera, that would be very much appreciated. I think we've felt with some of the recent changes to uh, uh, that have come down from the state that transition time has been inadequate. Okay, yes, and I, I would absolutely uh, double down on that, that, that um, I think our ability, especially now, uh, to ask for additional change, some, some, some real weird now, um, some really um, major changes quickly with all the things that are going on, I, I, I just think it's, it's, prop, it's incredibly problematic now more than ever. It's always, it always is an issue, but now it's just ridiculous. <laughs> Um, it's beyond. Yes. So, so, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, uh, thanks for that reminder, uh, Councilmember Reynolds, you know, or city manager, along with all of the other city managers. That's something that just uh, is incredibly stressful. Just trying to. Um, is there was there one thing that you could point to um, and and say what you were? Do you do you have anything in particular in mind as an example? I, I don't. I, I wish she were here. I'm sure she would. J Jason, okay. if, maybe maybe Jason can comment on that one. Uh, I don't have one specific example. I, I feel like the last two years in particular have just been a blur in every way. So, <laughs> so my apologies. I don't have one off the top of my head, but uh, well, your comment is well received for sure. You can always email me if you think of something. <laughs> but, but I, you know, I, I do think it just, so my, my, um, you know, focus, my main theme for education is recovery with equity, no new things, no big changes, make it better, smooth it out, whatever. And, and I, I, I think that that really has to be for all of us, um, you know, trying to, to just, you know, kind of get us, get us back to a recovery at, at a time when we're still, you know, we're still gonna be wearing masks, um, I now will always wear a mask during flu season because it's been so, I didn't have the flu this year. It was, it was you know, I think that people really benefit. So. I would agree. Uh, uh, Senator, I guess, uh, excuse me, I know you have our, a copy of our legislative priorities and so there's no need to go through them in detail, but I would say that, you know, just listening to the rest of the council, I know that um, item four, again, if you have it or if you know that this whole- in front of me, Mayor. Oh, so, so just this whole flexible local funding, uh, they're all tied together. I mean, basically uh, removing restrictions on re revenues. And again, we've already talked about the 1% cap. Um, so anyway, I, again- um, I'll give you one more thing. Yeah. Um, that again, from coming back from these multiple conferences that I've been at, Washington State, with one of the best economies in the, the nation in terms of uh, not only our AAA rating because we have a four year projection, et cetera, et cetera, and how we do it, um, but also the strength of our economy has, has so far been quite good and, and looks to be somewhat quite good. We are the worst in housing, any kind of housing, affordable, unaffordable. It doesn't matter, we don't have it. And we do have projections when you look at, you know, when I talk to, um, you know, Amazon building 25,000 new jobs coming into the Bellevue area. Um, it's all over this. The good news is that we're seeing exciting growth all over the state, but it is as, as bad in our rural communities as it is in our urban and suburban communities. We just don't have housing. And I think that that pressure is going to be Per perceived um, as 
something that we have to address. And I don't know what will be coming out of that. I try to not make it preemptive. You must do such and such because there, you know, you just don't want to go there. That, that really doesn't allow it. But I'm just telling you that I think that there's going to be enormous pressure uh, to be creative with housing solutions. Um, I, for instance, was somewhat disappointed that the housing that is going into the area by the new, um, uh, I keep wanting the, where the old insurance company was. Um, farmers, farmers Insurance. Yeah, yeah well, Farmers Insurance. I should know that better, but but it was reduced considerably. What was originally planned, I had heard, were many more potential townhouses than what eventually came out of that. What was going into that area? Um, uh, and I don't know if you you saw the news. I mean, it's relatively recent. So to your point, that um, Ryan Development that owned the yeah. property uh, recently sold it, and so they sold it to Riot Riot R O. R-I-O-T Games Inc. So it's a, it's a uh, gaming in, uh, software. So uh, frankly, I don't know what is now currently being planned on the parking lot, on the, the, this parcel that has all the parking spaces. So um, anyway, that's, that's something I haven't heard about. I don't know, Councilmember Reynolds, if you've heard anything. Uh, it's just, it, 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 again, the sale happened just recently so, so is, is, the, is the parcel of land that is the um the north end of the parking lot which is going to be developed is that locked in at with with what i heard which was i i don't know see it's not clear to me when riot games purchased the property that's all that was announced purchased it purchased it from ryan developments it was unclear what they specifically purchased if they purchased all the parcels, which would, would be the building and all the parking, parking spaces uh, you know, directionally uh, north of the building. So all the parking spaces. So I, I don't know exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so. Um, and and I, you know, I personally reacted because I know of the pressures to think it was, um, if there's going to be additional, if there's going to be additional pressure, we don't have that many places to make up, you know, kind of, and, and that really is one of them. And, and the other thing, of course, is that there are and could be, um, you know, kind of without it being prescriptive, there could, can be ancillary units um, uh, allowed and mother-in-law suites and all kinds of things, which I think is already allowable um, in Mercer Island. Right. Yes, Senator, I would just say on that issue, we're, we're certainly cognizant of the fact that the housing is a huge problem in the region and, and low income and workforce housing absolutely is a problem. I'd say anything you can do to create aspirational goals for us would be welcome. Uh, and anything you can do to provide funding in support of that would be welcome. Um, mandates may not be good for anyone yeah. Yeah. if for no other reason than because it's not very cost effective to build low income housing on Mercer Island. The money could be better spent elsewhere. <laughs> I totally agree, which is why I'm sharing with you that it is not, we're not just talking about low income housing. We're talking about housing. Housing, housing, yes. Housing, yeah. housing. Yeah. So smaller luxurious places would be fine too. <laughs> there we go. Okay, with, with that, I apologize. I need to leave for a medical appointment, but thank you very much for your time, Senator. Thank you so much. And thank does anybody else have anything else they wish to share? I don't see anybody's hand. Uh, Senator, so uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Well, thank you for putting it together, Mayor. I really do yeah. appreciate it. And, and Jason, anytime, or Chief, anytime you have a, 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 want to have a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I literally am 10 minutes away from you or less. <laughs> so I'm happy, I am happy to do that. And, and thank you so much for your service to, through these very challenging times, all of you. Great, thank you very much. And uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's, Happy Holidays. It's nice seeing you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Take care now. Okay. okay. Thanks, Senator. All right. Bye.